From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy. The Vitamins. The Energy. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunchavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Vitamin Energy. Coming up on today's show, we got Irish show fell again, everybody. Let's go. Renegade Express mailbag. But in honor of the five-star Irish show fell, we're taking the five best questions. We're talking about what did we learn from the game in this practice this week? Will there be an identity on offense that emerges? And we're generating discussion sparked by Cummins. Wake Up War Champs presented by Vitamin Energy. VitaminEnergy.com. Promo code WarChamp BOGO. WarChamp B O. G-O, buy one, get one free. Buy two, get two free. Buy seven, get seven free. And you might be like, Aslan, that sounds excessive, man. What do I need 14 boxes of this stuff for? Shush. Shush. So good once it hits your lips. I'm telling you, man, the uh, the new Immune Plus, that is the blue raspberry flavor. And listen, it's called Vitamin Energy. It's not called, like, you know, Delectable Delight. It's about giving you vitamins that you need, nutrients that you need, B6, B12, vitamin D, like real legitimate stuff that helps out your body perform at peak performance. And then the energy aspect, obviously, right? It's tough out there. I didn't sleep well. Man, has anybody slept well since that game? Come on now. But we need to get up every day and get after it. The energy helps. 260 milligrams of all natural caffeine and one little bottle of vitamin energy. It's not even two ounces. So try it. The Immune Plus Tango Orange, again, that might, I don't know. Then the Blue Raspberry just battling Sour Apple now, sadly in the bronze position, but I still love it. It's all good. VitaminEnergy.com, promo code WarChantBogo. WarChant.com, Ultimate Semble Sports Source, FSU1, two months, $1. Somebody in the comments the other day, how many, how many ads before we get to the show? Hey, man, welcome. Go into the show notes, item description on YouTube, where it says, it says like, show more. I know there's a whole bunch of hashtags and a bunch of nonsense in there, which I'm sorry about, but I got no control over that. But in there, it'll show you at what time we talk about everything. So it's usually like the three-minute mark we actually get to business. But, you know, some people don't mind. Like, all right, I'm going to hit play. I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to turn the engine on, and I'm going to get underway and drive into work, and Corey and Aslan are going to drive me in there, and it's going to be all good. Corey should be back in the States by the time you're all listening to this, but he's traveling on Thursday, which is when a large part of the show was recorded. So... Uh, no Corey today, but we'll have Corey on the Monday. Actually, yeah, we'll have Monday program. We'll have to preview the game once more because they actually play on Monday. That'll be the Tuesday show, the recap. Anyways, I'm going to stop rambling. We've got Irish show fell for about 25 minutes or so, or maybe even less because your boy's in a time crunch. He's got to get to Jacksonville for a girl. What? Ira, how are you, man? Thanks for doing this again, man. I, listen, I think you're going to, I think you did Wally Pip Corey, but listen, man, we can't spread you too thin, man. The, the folks need you on the smash. They need you on the Monday hit that you do on the Cameron show. They need you on headlines and we need you on warchant.com to keep the content flowing, man. Thanks for doing this. No, I'm glad to be back, man. Glad to see you. It's been a while. As long we haven't, uh, we haven't talked in a while. I know, right? Golly, gee whiz. Hopefully you checked out the uh, war chant rap that we did, which kind of summarized practice, but what did you take away? I guess, and maybe for the folks that don't watch the YouTube channel religiously, uh, what were you kind of hoping, I guess, maybe to take away from Thursday's practice? And, and what do you ultimately think uh, you, you took away from seeing that practice? Ultimately? I wrote a story that's up on the website now that people can read if they want, or they can go back and read it. Um, I I thought there was a little bit higher level of accountability on some things. I mean, I think you saw some players uh, taking some ownership and correcting other players, Maurice Smith getting on some offensive linemen, uh, you know, some assistant coaches getting on to guys about certain things. And I think, you know, it's not to say that they weren't, there was no attention to detail before the loss, but I think it ratchets, ratchets things up when you have a loss. And so, you know, we saw some of that. Um, I, you know, I thought maybe you'd see more, um, you know, fire in terms of like, you know, you know, like verbal, like just, you know, we're not letting this happen again or, you know, that kind of stuff that doesn't really mean anything. Um, but the reality is we, we weren't there for Tuesday's practice, you know, and that's, that's kind of the normal Sunday practice when they go over mistakes and, um, kind of flush the game before them and then start looking ahead. We were never at that practice on Sunday, so they did it Tuesday when they got back from Ireland, and we weren't there for that. So maybe some of that happened there, or maybe not. I don't know if that stuff even matters. Um, but that was one thing I was kind of looking out for and really didn't see it. But I did think that there was a little bit more 
fo- more critical eye from players and from coaches. And, uh, you know, Mike Norvell and some of the players talked about that after the game, after the practice. So that story's up on the site. And I, that was probably my biggest takeaway. Otherwise, like you said, um, you know, it was pretty standard fair. I mean, it's not, it's not like they made a bunch of changes to practice because they lost a game. And they don't have to. Like, right. and again, I, I don't know how many people are, are sick of hearing this, but it's, I mean, I don't want to pull the Dabo card out. Like, you know, if we played that team 10 times, how many times we beat that team? But like, you don't need to break this thing down to the studs and rebuild. It's just kind of like, all right, maybe let's fine tune some of these rotations. Um, let's, let's develop a little bit more of like a tenacious spirit, which I think they can, cause they always practice hard. They never take things lightly at practice, but for whatever reason, man, like, and I agree with what you said yesterday. And so did a lot of the people that listened to the show, Ira, that's that, you know, this was, this was the second time that, you know, Mike underestimated an opponent and both times, uh, you know, one was a little bit more of a catastrophic loss. This one, obviously not the way you want to start a season, but I just, I have confidence that they're going to make the proper change and they'll be able to get it done here in the next few days. I don't think they need weeks to figure this out, at least to like hit the the kind of the ceiling that Mozo's projected, like be 10 and two. Like if people want them to run the table from here on out to win the national title game and win whatever 15 games in a row, I, I don't know if they're gonna be able to do that, but it, I feel like they can get things on track to end up where we thought they were going to be two weeks ago, two months ago. So I'm yeah. Not- yeah. And, you know, I think like, you know, when you see poor tackling, you know, I think one thing, you know, you, you mentioned it after Adam Fuller spoke to the media, on Wednesday that, you know, he made some comment about maybe like, you know, you, you have to look at how you do things in practice or whatever. And, and so, you know, you wonder maybe they'll adjust some of those types of things, but like you said, you know, they had won 19 straight games before the orange bowl. Um, so it's not like they had to reinvent what they do. They need to do it better. And then on the other side, I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine, um, before we started recording and, and, uh, this person was talking about, you know, well, if you play soft, then that's who you are. You know, if you're not physical, you're not physical. And I'm like, I don't know if I buy that because there are guys on this team that didn't seem to play very physical at times in that game, but we've seen them do it before. Like I do think there are some players that have played college football, including some that played at Florida state who I would describe as not very physical football players, but they never were. It's not like it, it was, they, they were sometimes and weren't sometimes, you know, they, they either, they, a lot of those guys never had that in them. They just were not physical football players. Whereas I think a lot of the guys in this game that people are saying we're not physical in this game, we've seen them be physical in games and in practices. So it's there. Um, it just has to come out. Yeah. Yeah. We had, we had a lot of questions in the mailbag here, Ira, about toughness and such. I think we kind of touched on it <laughs> yesterday though. So we'll, we'll move ahead. We're going to do a, we're going to kind of bundle up maybe the five best topics that we can kind of get to our first guy. Island sheep says, wake up. Ira, welcome to the Renegade express An homage to your presence here today. I've got two questions <laughs> ah, for you. Perfect. Perfect. Regarding the war chant rap first, uh, have any questions you have about the team been answered following the press conference and the practice on Thursday? And secondly, how about the hate watching of the rap 37,000 views <laughs> How does it feel to do so well when the Knolls lose? That is a, it is a, an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Um, it is. It is. It's, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think like when, when Florida State wins and does well, the Knolls want to watch it and kind of rejoice in Corey's, uh, you know, tomfoolery and, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, us recapping the things that went well. And then when they lose, we probably get most of those people to watch. But then we, uh, we also welcome in all the haters. What? So yeah. this one. So the all-time three highest uh, viewed War Chant raps are this one, the Orange Bowl, and the Jacksonville State game. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. There's a common, yeah. there's common themes there. Yeah. Well, listen, we also, you know, this is a, you've made your bet and now you got a lie in it too. This was a, a lot of months of, of bashing on everybody, whether it's people on television or people on Twitter about the way they uh, – portrayed your team here and then uh, supreme right. confidence and then you're you're suing the conference to get out of it and you know all these things are kind of manifesting into a or con there's a confluence of all of them to create like a a surge of people that are like ooh let me uh let me yeah. you know bask in their misery or whatever but we're all right we'll bounce back hey welcome <laughs> haters then they fall in love with Corey and you are like ah oh, these guys aren't that bad i wish they covered my favorite football team but you floor state fans you're the lucky ones I'm sure Lucky that's what's, ones. I'm sure that's what they're thinking. Um, as far as questions I had, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like the biggest question I had was, would they kind of, would it, would they use this to that opening game to kind of isolate 
you know, who they want on the field, you know, and I think goes back to what we talked about, you know, yesterday and probably after the game and during the earlier in the week that, you know, it, it felt like they were, you know, they were, they wanted to play a lot of guys and see a lot of guys in that game. And, 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 um, you know, I think we've already seen some changes on the depth chart. Uh, I think Conrad Hussey starting. If you go back and look at the War Chant uh, Twitter account during the game, when Conrad Hussey came in for the second drive, like we, I tweeted that from the War Chant account because, and I didn't say like, you know, it was a mistake to not play him earlier, but I, I think Conrad Hussey's, uh, I think he's the best, best other safety. I think he's the best free safety to go with Shaheem. And, uh, and he's going to make mistakes. I mean, you know, he's, he is a, you know, basically a retro freshman. He's a sophomore. Um, and I'm sure he's going to make some mistakes, but that guy plays with a, a, a fierceness and, uh, he wants to hurt people sometimes, uh, including his own teammates. He'll get physical in practice. Um, so I, I think you want more guys like that out there. Um, but I'm sure he'll make some mistakes. And I think that, um, if you were playing Devontae Brown, Devontae Brown, by the way, had a really nice play in practice today, uh, in uh, Thursday's practice where he, um, did a great job in pass coverage to break up a pass where um, it didn't look like he was going to get there and re- made a really nice play. So he has got some skills, and I think maybe they were trying to avoid the big play, um, but I think maybe they need guys to make some big plays, and Conrad Hussey might be that guy. Um, and then, you know, I think they're going to shorten up some other rotations. I think we'll see that in the game. We can't really discuss it from what we see at practice because a lot of times it's tr- it's uh, it's all fluid. But I do think they're going to shorten up some things. So I think, uh, yeah, and there's been some extra accountability. So, um, you know, the only thing I said, like I said, I maybe was looking for is a little bit more fire and brimstone, maybe from some leaders. But I, you know, I don't know if that really matters. I mean, we, we all, you know, we all kind of want that out of like leaders. But I also don't know how much it actually translates all the time. Well, also, I mean, I guess at this point in time, it, it might feel a little forced, you know, there needs to be like a, a sincerity, like a genuineness behind it. Right. Um, not to say that, like, you know, you can you can't have that like brewing. I mean, like if a guy like Maurice Smith calls somebody out to the carpet, I mean, I I think that would go a long way, you know, although he's a pretty quiet guy. like He's built up enough equity to maybe do that kind of stuff. I saw from some position coaches, though, like and I'm like, all right, they're barking a little louder than they usually do. So that was kind of right. Cool to see, but. It yeah. felt like it, right? Like I didn't want yeah. to make too much of it, but I, I yeah. felt that. I, yeah. I agree. Especially in drills that were like the emphasis is physicality, where mm-hmm. it's like it was offensive line versus defensive line and got and it's just like, all right, man, that's that's nice to hear that being kind of emphasized. And it was it's Norvell as well, like going back and forth and, and re-emphasizing what his assistants are saying too. So uh definitely a good thing to to see and hear. Yeah, and I and that. I didn't mention this in the story because I'm not hundred percent sure it's true. But oh, so you're um, bringing on wake up or uh, it's, it's good enough. <laughs> hey, you can make the podcast. Who cares I'm, about the podcast? Hey, I've listened enough of Corey on this thing to know that <laughs> we don't, it doesn't have to be 100% true. We're to fast say and it. loose, we're fast and loose around <laughs> here sometimes. Uh, no, I I thought he spent a little more time with the defense in a few drills, uh-huh. um, uh-huh. today, and so that, I thought that was interesting. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't have a you know, it's not like I'm tracking where Mike Norvell is in practice, he floats around a lot more than a lot of head coaches do. Um, but it felt like, man, he was spent a little bit more extra time with some defensive players, which I think might be a good thing. Right, not that the talk. offense, not that the offense was great, but right. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about the offense a little bit. Then we got two questions, kind of like of a tweaks, possibly one's a, an admitted overreaction. The other one, um, some validity, but we'll see how far it gets along. Bradley Moss asking, I realize it's an overreaction, but do you think Mike would ever give up play calling to Atkins or tow cars? If the offense continues to struggle Uh, Then our guy Southside Mustang says, can we get an answer to the question of considering a faster tempo on offense? Seems that playing slower helps these inferior opponents hang around. So um, somebody asked me this on a podcast last week, actually Sirius XM with uh, Roddy, our guy Roddy Jones and uh, Mm -hmm. Ben Hartsock, if I'm not mistaken. They're asking me about like Mike and, you know, delegating play calling like, no, man, he does it. And they're like, and Ben Hartsock was like taken aback by him. Like, yeah, man, like he, he calls the plays. Um, I don't think he's going to give it up. And I don't, I don't think he needs to give it up, but um, he doesn't strike me as being too stubborn that if it, if push comes to shove, like he's not going to go the full Jimbo thing where it's, you know, he's going to wait till he's on his absolute ninth live to, to pull that uh, rip cord. But I don't think they need to uh, shake up the play calling duties, maybe some of the play calling, but I think Mike knows how to dial things up, but let's, again, let's shorten the, uh, the rotation. That'll probably help the play calling aspect. And I don't know, man, they've, They've never really played all that fast here. I know everybody would, would yeah. like that to happen, but that just, you know, that that 
isn't part of like the the DNA necessarily. So I, I don't know if that's something they are going to plan to unveil. Maybe it's something they work on like two minute drill stuff that we don't see in, the, in those final practices. But I, I think they're going to trust what they've been doing for a long time and just hope that shortening up some of these rotations, playing a little bit more physical, uh, that week one to week two jump happens and then everything takes care of itself. I yeah, and no, I agree with him. The tempo for sure. I, I don't. Uh, I, nothing about the makeup of this team really feels like an up tempo team. You know, it's not like you've got, um, you know, a quarterback that's like, um, you know, that I don't know. I, to me, like DJ is more of a, a traditional. I mean, part of the reason he came here, part of the reason he went to Oregon State, is he wanted to go to teams that can run the ball and can throw a play action, um, not necessarily be just spread five wide. You know you know, get it and rip it kind of offenses. And I don't, so I don't think it fits him. I don't think it necessarily fits the offensive line. I don't know that they've got great skill guys outside. I just, I think, you know, I know it feels like you want to be an up-tempo team because you've got real, some, you know, some talented players, but I, I don't think that, I, I do think the tempo should be higher than it is, but I don't think it needs to be breakneck. Um, and then the, about play calling, you know, the funny thing is like, I've never really <clears throat> understood the idea, you know, when we were calling for Jimbo to give up play calling, it wasn't because, and, and I was one of the people that said he should at one point, it wasn't because I didn't think he was a good play caller or because I felt like the offense, um, you know, there was something he that, that could be doing better. It was always more just, you know, I felt like sometimes the big picture was lost, you know, yeah. like during the game with Jimbo, sometimes I felt like he was so focused on his offense that he didn't always pay attention to other things like the way they've, you know, uh, you know, players were interacting or the defensive situations or whatever, but that's just how Jimbo coached. Like at practice, he, you know, I mean, he is focused on his offense. He's focused on the quarterback. That was his thing. It's his baby. And I thought that was a little bit distorted from what he needed to be from a head coach. Norvell isn't that guy, you know, Norvell's not, um, you, right. Jimbo, for example, during a game, right during a game, when, when, a quarterback would make a mistake or, or have a problem or offensive line, you'd see Jimbo go spend the next 45 seconds or two minutes with the quarterback or the offensive line, right? And mm -hmm. he'd go coach up those groups, which that's his prerogative. Norvell doesn't do that um, nope. during a game. I mean, he's focused on the big picture. So I don't think – I'm with you. I don't think that's a factor at all. And I think Mike Norvell's a great play caller. I think he's um, uh, really exceptional at that. Um, I just think – he didn't feel like they, you know, again, I just go back to, I feel like he didn't um, go into this game with the mindset of we've got to do all of this to be successful. I think he thought they were going to be successful just because they're bigger, stronger, faster. And that, that didn't happen. So I, uh, at some point he could do it. I think I could see him delegating like he did with Dillingham. If he, if it, if it was the way to get a coordinator that he really wanted in that he had to do that, yeah. but, <clears throat> or maybe Atkins at some point is like, Hey, if I'm going to stay here, I need to start calling plays. Then maybe you get there, but but I I don't think it's in the future. Yeah, I mean, let's again catch the ball, Cam Davis. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be a jerk here, but like you know that that wasn't a bad play call. And right. then of the the three or four shots that DJ did take downfield, I mean, I think one of them resulted in a defensive pass interference. Right. Um. So that was a success, you could say. And then you know some of the throws were off target, and you could say, well, listen, he should. He knows DJ and his flaws and his lack of accuracy, but I mean, you you have to take some shots downfield, and when you know he set things up properly for those. So I I, I don't yeah I'm not saying that everything was perfect, everybody, but again, it, it's it's one game, and and you know I, I get we're all overreacting, but at the same time, you know we, we we've seen it in action, so we have confidence in it. CPTallyBar.com. That's the website for Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. Daily lunch specials, Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. for only $8.99. Friday's chicken strip basket, hand-breaded, serve with a dipping sauce, or toss in a sauce of your choosing. And a side dish of your choice, straight fries, curly fries, onion rings, potato salad, broccoli, side salad, tater tots, or freshly cooked potato chips. Pick one of those, get you them chicken strips in a basket, get the dipping sauce, or have it tossed in a sauce of your choosing, all for only $8.99. Don't forget every week, Tuesday, trivia, Thursday night, bingo, live music on the weekends and happy hour weekdays from 4 to 7 p.m. And then they run it back from 11 p.m. to close plus all day Sunday. 
Big games on Sunday, too. Is AM playing Notre Dame on Sunday? Are the Tigers playing my Trojans on Sunday? Maybe I'll be at the CP Sunday. I don't know if we're going to do a meet and greet. We usually do those meet and greets. Not we, like Corey and Jeff. Not sure if that's happening or not. But it's always an awesome time at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, y'all. Our guy down in Naples, uh, M. Adam CZ. I know I want to call you Adam sometimes, Mark, but it's uh, it's Mark Adam check, everybody. Uh, defensively, by the way, here. by Go the ahead. way, real quick, Absolutely. you know how like uh, Corey a few times called Marvin Jones Jr. Marvin's, right? I have done that, and I heard somebody else do it recently. I can't remember who it on. was. It's a, it's an epidemic, man. It's it's there's something about Marvin Jones Jr. that makes you want to say Marvin's. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, I've uh, has I've been uh, inoculated from it, thankfully, but we'll see how it goes now that it's in my head. Uh, on defense, our guy Mark says he doesn't see the need for a scheme change unless you all do. They just have to play better. Fuller should make them watch film of the 23 defense against uh, Florida and Louisville over and over and over again. That's it. Offensively, though, Ira, what identity do you think is most likely to show up on Monday? Will they finally get a running game going, freeing up play action for DJ? Uh, to look downfield for those speedy wideouts, or is the running game a total coin flip right now? And does Mike need to let DJ rip it and then hope that the offensive line can pass protect well enough? Um, maybe DJ will find out that uh, he's got a six seven tight end who's very hard to defend. Uh, go Knowles, break Boston College's heart and soul, or just get a W. Yeah, uh, yeah it would be nice if uh, yeah if Kyle Morlock made. Uh made an entry into the passing game because he's definitely a weapon and we've seen it at practice. Um, yeah, I, I honestly don't think there needs to be anything major change there either. I think they just need to go play the way they can play. Um, you know, I think the, I think this will be an offense. We've talked so much about how it's going to be a run first team and maybe 60, 40 or 55, 30, 45, whatever the split would be. Um, but I think it's a team that can do both. And I think it's going to get better, um, as the year goes on, cause you just have so many new pieces. Um, I, it's not like today at practice, I saw the running game, like go to some new level. You know, we've right. seen good days and bad days, um, throughout camp. Um, my guess is if I, if I had to guess normally it gets Boston college and I have not scouted Boston college. So this is a, a, a I'm putting That's that Matt out Lacerre's there. Account. That's Matt Lacerre's account, everybody. <laughs> exactly. But Having seen Boston College in this conference now for going on 20 years, in general, you're going to have more athleticism on the edges. You're going to have better uh, – your your receivers and linebackers and running backs are going to match up better against their linebackers and DBs. Um, you're going to have some edges there. So if I – you know, with that blindly, I'm going to assume that Mike Norvell is going to find ways to isolate his playmakers, which he talked about on Monday, you know, this – or Wednesday – um, this is an offense built for playmakers and he's got to get those guys opportunities. I think he thought the offense would just, those things would just come out of the offense. My guess is, um, that he's going to be a little bit more detailed, um, in, you know, looking for specific matchups, you know, kind of like in a basketball game and saying, okay, if that guy's guarding our, if, if 22 is guarding 15, you know, you're, you're taking it to the hole or whatever. And like, they're going to look for matchups and try to exploit matchups more in this game. And I think you'll see that have success and then be able to run the ball too. I think it, I would be surprised if they come out and just bang their head against the wall, trying to run the ball in this game. I think it'll be more about getting guys in space uh, just because, you know, that's how generally that's how you would beat a Boston college. I think. Yeah. And listen, every defense wants to make you one dimensional and they want to start by like taking away the run. So it, it, it feels like I'm sure Boston college is going to do everything they can to prevent floor safe from being able to run the ball, uh, which I know this sounds like counterintuitive because we talked about how good this offensive line is going to be and how many, how many snaps they've played. But, you know, I guess, man, numbers are numbers, you know, when right. there's seven, eight in the box and there's only five of you, six of you uh, to block, like it, the, the onus is going to, and I don't know that if this is necessarily what you want though, if you're floor state and this was the, I don't think this was the blueprint when you did bring DJ down here. We are like, DJ, we're going to need you to throw deep to then open up the run game. Because I feel like DJ probably came here looking at this offensive line, and he's like, all right, man, and, and your guy's MO is to run the ball, and you're dedicated to running the ball, and you don't give up on it early. And then eventually that's going to give me the opportunity to make some plays. It just – it feels like – I don't know if this is an overreaction. It just feels like he's – it wouldn't hurt to maybe take a shot or two on that first sequence – uh, and loosen things up, even if you don't get the first down, just to maybe plant that seed in BC's head that 
uh, can open up some things. Because once that running game gets going and they start pushing guys off the line, uh, I think that that success that they felt they were going to be able to easily, uh, you know, ascertain against Georgia Tech, it'll then fall in line. Uh, but they're going to have to open and soften it up first. I think some shots are going to have to be taken downfield. Yeah, I could see that. And I also think that when they do, when when BC does bring numbers, to your point, because I think that's what Georgia Tech did, a lot of times it looked like Florida State, you know, the offensive line was terrible, but it's, you know, it was a number situation. And sometimes in pass protection, the back struggled. I mean, there were a few plays where running backs or tight ends did a poor job in picking up blitzes or or uh, helping out in pass protection. So that is, uh, uh, you know, especially if, it, if it's a running back, a lot of times that's going to be pressure up the middle. And DJ had some of that in that game a few times. Fortunate, they're fortunate, you know, he didn't turn any of those into turnovers. Um, but, you know, BC does the same thing. Well, now it's okay. It's on, you know, the backs and tight ends to help out and, and provide time. And it's also on DJ to make quicker reads and get the ball out of his hands. And so it all plays together. But and maybe some of that's play calling to make sure, you know, from Norvell to help him out. Um, in those situations. Again, with Jordan, especially the last year and a half, he he had this offense so stone cold. I mean, we yeah. used to joke about it in practice. There were there were times where, you know, pressure would come and Jordan would just throw it to a spot because he knew where everybody was supposed to be. Well, DJ's clearly not there. And so my, Norvell might need to help him out some. Uh, let's look, I guess, back on uh, the the impact of that game on Saturday, and obviously what Monday means. Uh, people want to know about uh, the state of uh, the team, and uh, I guess the record and the fan base mostly. Winkles asks, "Does a loss of Boston College on Monday erase the goodwill, the good vibes that Norvell and the staff gained last year?" Uh, he expects if they were to lose, the fan base is going to start eating its own children, gnashing teeth, and gouging out their own eyes. But I still will think that Mike Norvell is the guy. Uh, our guy Wack one six nine on a scale of one to ten, uh, how shocked are you with the outcome? He said it, he thought it was a nine, which sounds probably about right for me. I think like Jacksonville, well, I don't know, if Jacksonville State's a ten, then like anything else has got to be like an eight, um, because like it would have to be Jacksonville State two to to be a ten. Um, and then the uh, other one from this variety of question, our guy Jarenol, when was the last time the fan base was this upset about a loss? Uh, maybe there's the slightest of silver linings and all this anger over singular defeat shows how far this program has come. That's a good way to look at it, right? Like we, we become a little bit apathetic to the losses for a while. Uh, maybe, so maybe I should in, in, in embrace Ira, the, the people threatening to cancel their membership because <laughs> I tell them that the offensive line was going to be dominant and they weren't. And uh, they're all angry at us for all of our practice observations. Uh, there's a salad for you. Feel free to dig in however you'd like my friend. Yeah, I, on my surprise meter, I think I said a nine. Somebody asked me that uh, in that AMA I did on the message boards, and I think I said probably about a nine. Just I was more not because they lost. I mean, I thought this was a game they could lose before the season. I thought I've been saying for months. I mean, I thought there's five games they could lose this season. Whereas last year, I thought there's probably two games they could lose. Um, I'm not saying they're going to lose five. I predict them to go ten and two, but I could see five games, and this is one I could see. So it probably shouldn't be a nine. But I, where I put it in a nine, is just I was surprised by how they played. Like I did not expect um, the defense to play the way they played. I thought some of these guys that are new to the program were going to play at a much higher level. Um, and I thought, you know, the offense would figure it out. Um, and you know, they, they clearly really didn't. So, um, I was just surprised by the way they played. Um, and then as far as like the big picture and like, if they're zero and two, uh, it would be bad. Um, <laughs> it would be bad. No question. I don't know that it would erase all the goodwill. I mean, um, I think what it would say, and I think it's, you know, and I think Mike Norvell would have to really evaluate himself and, the staff, if, um, if you lose to Boston College at home, I, you know, again, that the Georgia Tech game, there's a million things that made that game a game I thought was really losable. You know, the fact that it's in Ireland, the fact that Georgia Tech had all that continuity, the fact that, you know, you had so many new players in the first game away and the new quarterback playing in another continent. Like, there were so many, like, things that, you know, the weather and you figure there were going to be kind of contributing factors. If you lose home to Boston College in, 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 basically the the process of bringing in a new coaching staff um and they weren't terrible last year it's not like he took over an 0 and 10 team but but you know they clearly are not in great position if you lose that game i think the questions to mike norvell are uh how badly did you misevaluate um you know your roster because it's not like they held pat you know if you go back to right. last season you know at the end of last season we, there was speculation jeff cameron 
would say it a lot. I can't remember what your position was. Jeff Cameron was pretty strongly of the belief that they shouldn't maybe go out and make a big push in the portal and maybe just, um, you know, ride with what you got, take a, a, a rebuilding year with Brock at quarterback or, or Tate, if he stayed and, um, you know, just kind of build for another run in 2025. Mike Norvell clearly didn't do that. And the battles end supported them and they went out and got a lot of marquee transfers and they kind of pushed their chips back into the middle of the table. Well, if you're zero and two with a loss at home to Boston College, I mean that's to me you've you either woefully misevaluated what you have in terms of who to go get and and what you have on this roster, or you you feel like there's a disconnect somewhere in the locker room and on the team and in the camaraderie, I don't, which I don't think is the case. But those are the questions you have to ask at that point. Um, so that would be it would just put a different. Um, you know, yeah, people would be devastated. I don't think it erases what happened in the past, but it would call into question a lot of the decisions that were made this offseason, right? Yeah. And, you know, shout out to you for trying to answer. I, I don't think I got any answers after that game in Ireland, but I, I would imagine that we will get answers after the Boston right. College game for better or worse. So uh, let's hope, obviously, for the better. Uh, on the way out, I we had a, these are questions I can't uh, talk about intelligently, so I, I hate to defer to you, but people obviously they want to know about linebackers, and somebody's asking about the uh, the in helmet communication. They thought that was going. I think our uh, Candy Knowles was asking about whether uh, you know, what happened with that, assuming that was going to be something that was going to give the uh, the team an edge, and it seemed to not work out that way. Um, or our guy Marlon Joker uh, did also want to point out that. Uh, he remembers you asking Adam Fuller about that long drive during the scrimmage. And when Adam <laughs> snapped at you, uh, that was a big tell for Marlon that the defense might be in trouble, but not to the extent that he saw on Saturday. So uh, victory lap on that one. But yeah, you know, linebackers, I just, I mean, listen, we asked Adam Fuller about it. He talked about the positioning and, um, you know, the gap integrity is, is one thing when guys, you know, in the way you draw it up, but then guys get moved. So I right. feel like, Maybe the onus is on the front four guys to, to not get knocked back this time, but that's oversimplifying. And then I don't know about the helmet communication. I just, I get it. Everything that's out there. We just think that Mike is sharper than the average bear, which he, he is. I think he is more than Brent key, but Brent key got the better than that day. So I don't know how much the helmet stuff is going to be a factor moving forward. Yeah. You know, I probably bought in or uh, I was drinking the flavor aid. Is that what it is? Is that what Corey tells us it was? Yes. It was not Kool-Aid. Correct. Uh, Correct. Uh, I think I was drinking that because, because Norvell and Atkins said that, like they specifically said that because Norvell, remember, remember when we asked him about the helmet communication when it was just proposed and he said he didn't want it to change. Yep. He yep. was not a proponent of this, but when they did it, he and Alex Atkins, I don't remember Fuller talking about it, but I'm sure he took the same approach as, okay, well, this is what it is, so we're going to be better at it than everybody else. Well, clearly they were not. Uh, I think it may be a situation where, where uh, they're going to tinker with it. You know, I think it may be a situation where, um, you know, maybe there were times where they they talked too much. And, it, um, you know, one thing that we never, we never really talked about, and it's not a big deal, and I don't want to use it as an excuse – I'm curious if they realized that everything about that game was going to be a true road game. Like with the PA guy yelling up until the snap music playing right before Florida state was going to snap the ball, that train, that train whistle. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing they knew that was, I mean, I knew it was, we, we all knew it was George tech's home game. Um, you know, the paint field was painted for them. The stadium was decorated for them. It was their home game because they're the ones that gave up a home game for this to be played. So I get it. I don't know that I expected it to be a true road game. Like, were they practicing extra with noise last week? Um, no, I, we weren't no, here. No, they weren't. They weren't. Yeah, but I, but that, I don't think the noise as much of a factor, no. though, as like the the overall aesthetic, though, and the feel of it, though. Because yeah, like you hear that that freaking whistle going off, you're like, what? Is, like what? Like what? Where where, where am I right now? <laughs> right. Um, that was a yeah. bit bizarre. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and again, I'm not saying it was a factor. I'm just saying like you add that into. The fact that they're using this communication for the first time, the very first time in a game, um, again, you're you know you're playing a, a first opponent, first game, week zero. It's still August. I think all of those things combined, um, you know, make it. It's got to be a little bit challenging for a coaching staff to identify. Okay, what do we need to change? Um, but I think they'll be tinkering with that. Um, and I, you know, like like you know, Candy. It was a Candy or whoever it was. Yeah. I, I I also assumed it, they would do a good job of taking advantage of it better than their opponents, but um you know it, it's something I think it'll be a work in progress. Um and then uh, Marlon yeah man 
uh, somebody asked me after the game, like, well, or on that, that AMA thread, um, you know, do you expect Norvell to be, or do you expect Fuller to be snarky with you? Um, again, if you ask about the defense and I, I, I took when he got a little defensive in the game or in that press conference, like it was just the fact that they apparently had played really well, the whole scrimmage. Right. And so I bring up that one long drive and I think he was, you know, going to defend his guys, which was understandable. I didn't have any problem with it. Um, you know, and, and I thought, man, it, you know, I thought his, I thought his press conference, I don't, we didn't talk about his press conference that much yesterday, but I thought, um, he was very blunt. It seemed like to me. Yeah. Um, Listen, when he was right? asking about linebackers, like I said, I'm yes. sure I said when they, oh, what do you think about the linebackers? Well, they're playing at not ideal. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, man, he's not happy. Um, and it, right. it, it felt like a frustrating, not ideal as in like, at what point is this going to get fixed kind of a thing, you know, and like maybe I need to do something to, to light a fire under that unit. So um, yeah. that was my sort of takeaway from that. Yeah. So, so uh, I guess, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I'm not sure why Marlon took that as like a, a great concern. I, I, I didn't take it as a overcompensating or something like that. When he did that, I, I just took it more as, um, and Marlon, you can tweet at me. I know you're on Twitter and other places. If you want to clarify it or on the message boards, but, but I took it more as, you know, Hey man, I'm going to defend my guys. We had one rough drive in, you know, in a two hour scrimmage. And so I'm going to defend my guys, but, um, I, you know, I, I, you know, again, I, I, I think it's good that they're not overreacting, um, yeah. just to overall kind of put a, a bow on this. Like I, I don't think they're overreacting to one game. I think they look at a lot of reasons why it didn't go well. And I think they still believe in this team and, you know, we'll see on Monday night. If, if it doesn't go well, then yeah, man, the, the questions are going to get a lot different, um, starting next week. Fun one on the way out. JML 16, Raz and Shine, gentlemen. A little travel log break from the normal questions. When in Ireland, who was the most covered Irish artist group at the pubs you visited? Ooh. Well, here's the here's the funny thing. You know what cover I heard the most my, the entire week out let, there, Ira? Let me, let, me, let me guess. Let me guess. Hold on. Let me ask. Was it uh, Country Roads? I heard what? that a lot. What? Why? What was going on everywhere? Jump <laughs> and everybody in the pub goes nuts. It's it like is. it's their national anthem. <laughs> yeah, man. We heard that in Galway. We heard it in Dublin. I heard it a bunch of. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's like a. It's just hey, we're we're a tourist city now. We've got to play this for the Americans when they show up. But it wasn't like I don't think they did it just because it was like no, Florida it State. spoke to their soul, Ira. Like living in the countryside <laughs> of Ireland, like these country roads take me home, right, man. Like, right, no, nah, I guess you're right. Yeah, so they just adopted it, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, there was more country covers than I expected. 100. percent Yes, yes. Which I was fine with, man. I'm. Hey, when the Guinness oh, is flowing, got, all right. I must say, Ira's got a little got a little honky tonking, you know, big well, guy. No, I'm just saying when the Guinness is flowing, I think I, we were good with everything. We did find a, uh, uh, found a, we were in one bar in Galway that was playing some good, some, some, even like some eighties, nineties hip hop and stuff. It was, uh, I thought the, the nice thing about Ireland is, and I guess this is true across Europe. I, I haven't been to many other countries. Um, but you know, it's, it's pretty much going to be the music we're used to, you know, it's not like there's going to be. Of a, a completely different musical selection um, in most places. Yeah, American music setting the uh, setting the trends out there. That's what we the, do. Yeah, Warchant.com setting the uh, agenda for uh, Florida State football coverage. Ira, right, thanks so much for doing this the last few days, man. Appreciate the heck out of you. Hopefully, Corey will uh, resume uh, the greatness. If not, now he knows there's somebody pushing him, pushing him. Exactly. Hard. Now he knows. Thanks, Aslan. Famous man once said, actually might have been a woman, uh, but that abs are made in the kitchen. So all that working out that we do, Corey and myself, uh, you still got to eat right. And usually that means eating at home. But man, that's so annoying, right? Like all the dishes, having to go to the grocery store, measuring everything out. That's why I should check out HelloFresh. We used to do this a few years ago. Remember everybody, HelloFresh? Uh, go to HelloFresh.com slash free war chant. For an offer for 10 free meals, free shipping, and free breakfast for life? Question mark? But this stuff was great. There's literally recipes that they sent me two, three years ago that I still use at home. But it doesn't quite hit the same. Some of these spices they use are proprietary. And you People on the internet try to match it, but they fall short of the glory of HelloFresh. But these meals show up 
like properly packed in dry ice. Um, everything is pretty much proportioned out. So like it helps out with the entire measuring and like utensil usage. Like everything's pretty much ready to go. You just either throw it in the pan, throw it in a bowl. Um, and it lessens the load because like, I don't really mind cooking at home. I just hate doing dishes. I found that hello fresh gave me delicious meals and also lessened the dishwashing aspect component because I don't have anybody to help me out with that stuff. So womp womp for Aslan. Check out HelloFresh. Again, HelloFresh.com slash free war chant for an awesome introductory offer. All right. As we sift through the mailbag, we always want to find something that's going to generate discussion. <laughs> um, usually, you know, I'm not one to take pandering, but uh, this person asked kindly. So let's go ahead and fire up that generator. And let's fire up the cameras. And looky here, everybody. It's Michael Langston joining us on Wake Up Board Can out of nowhere. Uh, we appreciate Michael being here with us. Generating discussion. It's sparked by Cummins, everybody. You know how this works. And if you don't, Michael, what people do is they subscribe to WordChant.com. They go to the Tribal Council. Every single week, we do the Renegade Express. Mm-hmm. And the best question that's going to be the one that generates discussion. Uh, we showcase it here in this little video. They can get entered into a drawing to win a gift bag at the end of every month. We'll do a drawing at the end of this. And a grand prize drawing for either a portable generator or a portable power station at the end of the year. Again, all you got to do is go to Instagram, follow Cummins Lifestyle, do that. Be a subscriber to WarChant.com. Michael's here with us. And Michael's a recruiting question. That's why we have you here with us. Okay. By FSU Uncensored. This is a long one. I had to shorten it up, but here it goes, Michael. Wow. He wants to talk about how quickly the high school recruiting landscape has changed since NIL. He says there's a narrative around the program that Florida State needs to consistently show results year after year to bring in game-changing elite players. He believes that held true in the past, but he sees Florida, Miami, Tennessee, Auburn, to name a few, that are continually out-recruiting Florida State despite those teams having won nothing of significance. It appears there's n- enough of a sample size to show It's not just about showing results anymore to the recruits. So, Michael, having lost our top recruits each of the last few years and other highly rated commitments late into cycles, what, if anything, in your opinion, needs to change? And at what point does FSU, if at all, decide to start outbidding for high school players that could be game changers in the trenches and at the skill position? Yeah, that's a a great question. Um, Obviously, I'll say what I've said before, Um, you know, and go into other stuff. But the thing is FSU is viewed differently when it comes to, and they're judged differently when it comes to this stuff. And, and, and stuff he said is it's good points where, yeah, high school recruiting, they're going to, they're not, they haven't been quite as good as those teams. Now they've been solid. I think people forget how, you know, the type of prospects they're bringing in, but yeah, it's a problem. Um, You know, as far as, you know, needing to be better now what you can do i don't know i mean you, if you want that then you're certainly going to have to either do one of two things you're either going to have to develop more to the nil from the high school market which fsu seems to be more big on proven guys than they are guys that haven't done anything um so may, maybe you could give more to that or you're going to have to make some changes on your staff where you have more talented, um, you know, recruiters that, that can land. Cause there, there are a few that, Hey, they're, they're getting, they're getting the job done, but there's not quite as many, you know, boom type, that type of uh, ads of, of in the class. And, um, but overall, I, I think the best thing you have to stay with who you are and what Mike is, is built on relationships and built on, uh, you know, product and development. That's what they've done. Now I see that obviously with the results from that first game, people are going to be like, yeah, well, this ain't working. The, you know, you know, transfer portal sucks and all this stuff, <laughs> you know, just, it's not working, but I still say one, it's a one game thing. And two, you have to see how the rest of the season, as far as the process of how they develop for the year, you know, if they come in there as long and they win 10 games and they come back and win 10 games, and and then they beat their two in state rivals. Um, you know, it's it's gonna be tough to change drastically, but I think overall, yeah, if this continues, yeah, it's something like you have to adjust and they're gonna have to do a few different things that yeah, they see this not working. You know, whether it's like I just said, pay a little more NIL what you do and emphatically put in there or 
Um, or like I said, the coaching changes and get more top recruiters on the staff that really, you know, kind of help you. But like I said, FSU is judged differently. You know, people might not like it, but that's just the way it is. They're judged differently. They don't be, they're not looked upon the way Miami is. Yes, we know Miami stinks. They never do, do anything. Florida is in the SEC, so I think that's a different type of argument. So Florida is always, I think, going to get top players, whether they're having a new coach or not. They're in the SEC. They have that boom for what that will bring. But um, And then FSU, too, I go back to this, Aslan. They've only had one dominant year. You know, so you have to be consistent and recruits want to see consistency from a five, six year pattern. And we're in there. Yeah, it's great what Mike's done, but we're still in a they had one dominant year where they're 13 and 0. And then before that, yeah, they won 10 games, but th- it wasn't a dominant 10. There was teams they lost to that they shouldn't be losing to uh, if you're a great program. And those teams like Ohio State and Georgia and those teams he mentioned, they're consistently good every year. Yeah, you can compare you have certain exemptions like, you know, Miami or Florida, but I, I just mentioned Florida, but Miami, Miami staff too is very centrally located in state. So they're going to recruit better. They have better ties with the, the people. So your pro your product matters, uh, you know, to what they've done. And it's, it's been successful, but uh, this year we're finding out that, Hey, it's not working so well as for, at least in the small sample. So really, uh, those two things I would I would you know, potentially change if you want to shift in that, and then two, um, you just have to realize it's a process to what FSU is doing. Where it, I think people just want to move FSU ahead instead of understanding like they only had one dominant year and they're still building to where they want to go. But uh, yeah, those are the two things I'd put out there. I get it, but it, you know, it goes back to the fact that like, you know, Florida hasn't had a dominant year since I don't know, Steve Spurrier was there. Yep. Um, you know, I get it, Urban Meyer. You know, same yeah. thing with Tennessee and Auburn. Yep. Um, so it's like it, I just don't know. Just because you get a kid that's a, a high school stud, look at Caleb Downs. I guess maybe that's a little bit of an anomaly because he lost his head coach, but just because you outbid yep. and get a five star game changing guy from high school doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to keep that kid for all three years. They could still end up leaving. So, you know, and then, you know, yesterday's price isn't today's price. So whatever they got as a true freshman, yep. you might want more of that as a sophomore. If they played even a little bit better. So, yep. Um, and that's, and that's the point I've been mentioning as long with our people on the boards that like, Hey, they just need to get more. It's like, yeah, but who's, who's a lot more likely to stick around the guy that's in, in the portal that, that has a lot invested into where he's at, say he's with FSU. He has a lot more invested and he's played. Uh, and the guys that are already in your program, you're going to invest into those guys. They've done a really good job of, of retaining their guys that they have on their team. And, and so there's a lot more focus on, on production inside the program or, coming into the program than there is high school guys. Cause there's no guarantee those kids. I've seen uh, brew McCoy went to Tennessee and he didn't even play a down with Tennessee. Like those guys can leave anytime they want. So if your, your take is just pay more for high school kids. Yeah. Well, you better understand that you're going to have to keep them too. So uh, if you put that dedication to that, you know, that can hurt. And then the other thing is I think FSU seen where remember the Keldrick Falk recruitment, that FSU was leading forever. Uh, Hugh Freeze all of a sudden gets the job. So in a, in a week and a half, FSU lost uh, Keldrick Falk in a week and a half. In a week and a half, after putting three, two, three years into that recruitment, they got hosed and got and they didn't get the kid. And then so that's the other dynamic that I think people forget about. That oh, just get them and just just have top five class for FSU and lights and everything's fine. It's like, no, it's about retaining and about what you're actually going to have on the roster. That's why I always tell people to me, it's about what the roster looks like. It's what the roster makeup is. When I look at FSU, that's why I, I, I sense success off of is what does your roster look like? Cause at the end of the day, that's what we want to see is, you know, what is the roster going to be? And, and can you keep these guys of whoever you get? And I think that's the dynamic you throw in. That's why I gave the two scenarios of things that you could do to maybe help it. But uh, I think Mike is 
is really big on on continuity and really big on what they preach and what they sell and what they pitch and and what the program is. You know, they've not paid a lot of going out of the way and just paid a lot. If a kid's NIL centric, they haven't gone out there and said, okay, we're going to just pay you. Like there, there's a, there's a level of to the way they do NIL compared to everyone else. Yeah. I do wonder also, listen, I mean, it, it, it's a payroll to a certain extent. It's not, I know some of you guys are donating to uh, battles end, but there's obviously <laughs> somebody that's kind of, you know, bearing the brunt of all this. And yes. Um, you know, to have them, you know, fork over a check. It's like, I don't know how much Jeremiah Smith costs. That would obviously be a really nice piece of the puzzle, but yeah. maybe you were able to get three players as opposed to just getting him. So it, it's, it's a really weird thing. The only thing I can maybe recommend and listen, I don't want to like talk out of school, but like if you are donating money to rising or not rising spear, but uh, a battle Zen, I mean, mm-hmm. maybe it's all like, I'd, I'd rather this money go towards getting like a five-star high school kid. I don't know yep. if they're going to listen to that or not, but <laughs> you can get your voice heard by that. And then also one last thing, Michael, let, I, I don't know the specifics, but a lot of people want to high Keem Williams. Yeah. You know, and M want to high Keem Williams. A lot of other teams want to high Keem Williams and Florida state won that one. And I, we can, you know, I'm, I'm sure relationships are a big part of it, but I'm sure Florida yep. state also stepped up in other aspects. Yeah. So like it. So they've done that and, and listen through, you know, 14 games of him being here in Tallahassee, he's, he hasn't done a lot. Um, and there might be guys that transferred in last year that have done more for Florida State, possibly. Yep. So it's it's a really weird balancing act. I get it, but I, I don't I don't see the staff, Michael, as constructed. You know, maybe if he brings in new assistants, they'll get in Mike's ear and change his mind on the philosophy. Yeah. But as it stands right now, it seems like to him, they can build a core and get their finishing piece in the transfer portal as opposed to rolling the dice and trying to get an 18 year old kid that might not pan out right yeah you look at their high school classes uh, i think from average when i see you know i see consistently you know top 15 you know what they get you know but i think i know i get it people want top five and top 10 but they've gotten guys off the nil this year off their class guys they have go look at their class i've already covered dalen mccutcheon that was an nil one uh, there's several guys, CJ Wiley. That was the one that was surprised Malik Clark. They got him. These are NIL guys that they put emphasis in that they get. Now it can't be just everything NIL all the time. Um, it can't be NIL centric where it's just cut a check and that's it. Uh, they're, I just don't think Mike's going to go for that and do that. I think he's going to stick with his own philosophies of what they believe in, what their core of their team is and what their core of their team is built on is development work ethic and all these things. Um, and, and two, you have to have a plan with NIL. It isn't just, Hey, pay me and give me your money. It's like, there has to be a plan of what you plan on doing with, with, with the NIL part. That's had to be what you're giving to somebody, but there has to be a plan. So that's the way Mike's done it. Um, and as you said, y- you can adjust a few things and, and, and maybe if, if it do- goes bad, yeah, you might have to make some changes uh, within your staff of, of getting a few better recruiters. But outside of that, I, I don't, I don't know how much you can change of the stuff that we've already covered, where there's no guarantee if you, you pay for high school kids and two, the success of how they built the roster is, is strictly all portal and high school combined. And that's the way they feel works. And that's what they think works. And until it doesn't, uh, we still have a full season. So like I said, what if FSU wins 10 games again? Okay, they're averaging 10 wins a season the last three or four years. So how are you going to argue against what the results are? I get it. You might hate it that Florida's getting this five-star or Miami's getting this five-star. But if the product is working of organizing a roster and they're getting 10 wins a year, you can't really, uh, I think, really crap on the whole whole situation of how they're doing it. All right, on the way out, let's give away some free stuff. Yeah. Uh, first of our great friends over at Cummins. Be a member of Warchant.com. Submit a question each single week on the Renegade Express and be the winner generating discussion. And you get featured on the show, and then you get entered to the drawing. August was a little bit of a choppy month, as you can see. We only got two people here, Michael. It's going to either be Southernmost Seminole or <laughs> Nick Knowles 97. Woo! We spin the wheel. Yeah. The winner is going to be the red team oh <laughs> nick Knowles, congratulations nick Knowles 97 we'll get your uh, mailing address your real name as well as your uh, shirt size preference and we'll mail you out a uh, 
a free gift bag, courtesy of our great friends over at Cummins. Cummins Lifestyle. Follow them on Instagram, everybody. Michael, thanks for doing this, man. Appreciate the heck out of you. Anytime, bud. You know, I'm relatively sure if Adam Smith, the father of economics, was with us today, he would be a fan of Manscaped. Smith, as you all remember, argued things like the invisible hand and, more importantly, specialization, saying that companies are going to grow, hires are going to be made, and they should have defined roles and specialize in one skill. So, yeah, you've got some clippers, but they have a role. Manscaped has a more specialized place in a man's grooming arsenal. Some might say a more delicate role, one involving the moneymaker, to bring it back to Adam Smith and economics. How about the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra? It features skin safe blades and a cordless design, which is kind of clutch. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code WARCHANT at manscaped.com. 20% discount, free shipping. Manscaped.com. Be him and trim. And hey, before we go, contributions from Corey Clark, everybody. Co host of Wake Up War Chant, also senior writer, lead writer of WarChant.com. Also coming off the honeymoon, everybody. Shout out. So he gave us over-unders last week. He's giving us over-unders this week. How this is going to work, everybody, is that we're giving out $10 in Garnet and Gold gift cards. One to our valued, beloved subscribers over at WarChant.com and one to the rest of you lot. Here's how it works, though. There's going to be a Google form link that's going to be tweeted out from the Wake Up War Chant Twitter account. So that's how all you folks out there that aren't members can get a hold of this contest. So you'll go to this Google form. Like you got to put in your valid email address. We're not going to farm it out or anything, anybody. There's a tiebreaker field at the end of it. I don't know what the tiebreaker is going to be, but we'll throw a tiebreaker in there. If you are not a member, I need you to put N slash M. I don't care if it's capital N, lowercase M, N slash M. That means you're not a member. And then that way I can sort it out and find out who's not a member and got the best over under results. Sounds a little complicated, but we're giving you $10 in garden and gold money for free. So bear with us. Nonetheless, we go to the over unders. These are all provided by Corey Clark. And then I'm the number six one here in the lineup. Five and a half over under tackles for loss for the Florida State defense. Number two. Four and a half over under the number of Florida State running backs who play a snap. Tricky. Number three, 55 and a half over under Boston College quarterback rushing yards. Tommy Castellanos. Not Thomas anymore. It's Tommy. A little bit nervous about that. Number four, four and a half. The number of Florida State wide receivers with a catch. Wide receivers. Kyle Morlock does not count. I don't care if he's split out wide. He is not a wide receiver. Number five, nine and a half over under. Shaheem Brown tackles. He led the team in tackles last week with like 11, I think. And then mine, 20 and a half over under DJ Uwe Ungalale completions. So there you have it, everybody. This will be posted tacked on top of the Tribal Council of Warchant.com for all of our subscribers. Easy to get to. The rest of you folks, follow Wake Up Warchant on Twitter. We'll tweet out the over-unders probably sometime on, like, Saturday. Um, and then you can hop in there and, and fill it out, give it a shot. And then um, if you win, we get $10 in Garden and Gold gift card money. So um, put your valid email address in there so I can get a hold of you. And then in the tiebreaker field, just put N slash M. Forward slash, I think, right? The one that's leaning to the right. That's the forward slash. All right, that's it from the over-unders. That, too, is a wrap for Wake Up War Chant for this episode and for this week. We'll be back normal schedule next week, promise. I lied. Actually, I don't know with the game and everything. But yeah, we'll do it. We got to do it. I mean, come on. This is ridiculous. It's football season. We didn't do five shows this week. I can't believe it. Unbelievable. For everybody that was a part of this program today and this week, I thank them. And I thank you for downloading, subscribing, listening, commenting, generating discussion, popping energy shots, eating at Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, using Manscaped to groom yourself. You guys are the best, for real, for real. FRFR, Foxtrot Romeo, Foxtrot Romeo. I'm Aslan. Thanks for listening to Wake Up Board Champ, presented by Vitamin Energy.